No, we need more of Spencer. What's that? Anti-heroes. No. Villains who are relatable and aren't really villains. No. Villains of circumstance. No. We want characters that we can identify it with and go, hey, that guy, he's bad, but only because the good guys are gooder than yeah. the bad guy. But barely. Yeah. That's, a, that's uh, what was an example? Um, uh, Oh, th- that's what it was. You brought up Craven, the yes. new Craven the Hunter movie, which he's not going to be a hunter anymore either. No. He's going to be like, uh, he loves animals. <laughs> I guess the It'll opposite an, of what the fuck he is. An animal lover. <laughs> be a PETA guy. Like, you fucking idiots. Like, he's Craven the Hunter. He's a bad guy. But no, they're going to make him. Well, we can't make him bad. We're going to make. Who do they cast for that? The uh, the guy, the kid from uh, Kick-Ass and who played. Uh, I forget his name. But yeah, he was the uh, fast guy from Marvel movies. Yeah. That was terrible. Magneto's son. I can name every part of his <laughs> character. <laughs> but yeah. Quicksilver. <laughs> Quicksilver. <laughs> they botched which, that character. Which, uh, understandable. I don't know if he ever actually got that name in the one movie that he was in before they killed him. Honestly, I wouldn't mind seeing him as Wolverine if they're just going to keep a tall, buff Wolverine. Yeah. Like, if they don't care about the height thing, because he's fucking jacked, and as far as I know, he's an all right actor, so that'd be okay. But no, he's going to be Craven the Hunter, but the the big selling point besides him not being the Hunter is stupid. Craven the Hunter is a big Spider-Man villain. Yeah. His main story is when he hunts... And he kills Spider-Man and buries him and then wears his suit to be the Spider-Man. Which is awesome. And then eventually just fucking kills himself. But now he has to be a bad good guy or a good bad guy. I don't well, know. It's like the same as like with the Morbius movie. Yeah, instead of being a bad vampire, he's going to be the unlikely anti-hero. I mean, they've been doing this for a while with like Venom and stuff like that. And then there was talks there for a while. Venom's supposed to be a bad yeah, guy. Yeah. He eats he, brains. Just, he looks cool, yeah. but he's a bad guy. Well, and that's when people started liking him, and they were like, well, we can't have these people be liking this bad guy this you, much. You know what I'm going to go with, Spencer? Wrestling, yeah. because this is what happens. We got the bad guys who were so cool, the Rays of Ramones, the, uh, there's some other classically awesome bad guys that people liked, but like when The Rock went bad, yeah. like the guys who, they're bad but the fans like them more as right. bad guys, and they're cheering them. That's what we've gone to, and that is not a classic bad guy. I don't think that's good in fiction. I mean, it can be okay. Well, it's it, again, it's it's good in moderation. But whenever the whole, whenever it seems like the whole thing is tilting that way, like there was a uh, in that Obi Wan uh, show on Disney Plus. I don't watch it just from stuff that I've heard. They, it's it, like I guess there for a couple episodes they were toying to- with the. With the idea of maybe uh, Doc Vader, when he was a kid, didn't murder all of those children. He might like let him go or turned him into like the dark side, like you know what I mean. Uh huh. And like, cause it was a Kevin Smith podcast, and he's like, "Oh, I thought that was a kind of like a, cause I guess the way that they did, they, I don't know the way that they did." It. He's like, "That seemed like a like a nice, neat like retcon to like where this this whole like Star Wars thing is kind of like." You're very kid friendly and stuff, and then you just have this one scene. He murders a bunch of children. (laughs) Is that Disney's line, murdering children? (laughs) And then, uh, but then uh, the other guy, Mark Mark Bernard, is like, well, well, no, I hope they don't, because that kind of makes the folk, like, you know, because he kept on referring to. uh, That's immense that he's a bad guy, no matter what. He kept on referring to him as Space Hitler. Yeah. Because that's always kind of like what Vader was, was Space Hitler. Um, when you get and, rid of the Hitler part, he's just kind of a cool looking dude in space. Yeah, and it's like so like if you get rid of that, like you don't have that bad guy for your good guy to go against. And I and I think it's weird too because I I don't think people and I and I don't think it's necessarily the fans of what the shows or books or whatever. It's it's always like the higher up. It's like well we can't have people be liking the good guy all the time. Like you know what I mean? You, Why? You know, I don't know. I, We've I been doing it for thousands of years. Yeah, because I mean, like, there's good things of like you know, like the Punisher and and stuff like that. You know, he's very anti-hero. Like, you know, he kills people, but he kills bad people. You know, who mm-hmm. kind of deserve it. You know, whatever. But yeah, I just think it's a very uh, slippery slope of whenever, um, as in a whole, as the medium is, if they try to rectify that, because then it kind of takes away a big chunk of your story and motivation. Well, if you look at Morbius, pretty I would say Bond. It wasn't good from what I oh, hear. No. Uh the Venom movies, wow, I haven't watched those, but from what you told me and stuff, 
kind of like old early 2000s cheap entertainment maybe like a popcorn movie you watch but they're not really like good right no they're not anything you'd be like oh man that no. was like emotional like it's a lot of that is because who's the bad guy when the bad guy is kind of the good guy yeah so if your main character stars the bad guy playing the anti-hero good guy who's gonna be the well, bad? they'd have to be extra atrocious to be bad guys and like the problem with that too is with um those especially like those uh marvel ones is like when you don't have spider-man even making an appearance or a reference to him or anything like that it like you know it really drags it and you know really makes it wonky because then it's like you don't even have anybody for them to be bad against to begin with to then try to be good Hey, what's up, man? Hey. I think hey. you're all right now. Woo. We, uh, Spencer just faded away hey. there while he was talking. It was, it was like the microphone shit the bed or something. I don't, I don't know. Uh, so what were we talking about? Anti-heroes. Anti-heroes. So I would say maybe the uh, the last thing to kind of tap, tap onto that is I think going forward in some of my fiction, I'm going to try to have that be a focus of, like, trying to... A real to, bad villain. Yeah. I mean, you're just not having him kick babies and murdering dogs for no reason, but, you know, because, like, you can still make him a good, rich, full character by still making him being an evil piece of shit. Yeah. Yeah, you could give them good reasons and motivations for what they're doing and make people understand. And, I mean, and they can even still sympathize and relate to the bad guy with him still just being a you know, a piece of shit. Yeah, he's still an evil piece of shit. He doesn't have to be, you know, oh, he's still kind of good. That it doesn't have to be good. Like we don't need cool dark Vader. Like just make him evil space Hitler. Yeah. We don't need Morbin time. Just make him <laughs> fucking feasting on people when he's a dick. We need Craven the Hunter, not Craven the Gatherer. Well, that's like to go back to that stuff. It's like they've been talk Sony's been trying to talk about doing this Sinister Six. How are they gonna be the Sinister Six if they're all kind of good guys? It doesn't make any sense because they even kind of did that with Vulture. They like made him a character really. He's kind of cool though. Like he's not that bad. Like and then what was, was the other one? Killmonger. Yeah. It's like you understood his motivations, but and it was just like when I watched the movie, I was like, just kind of give him at the fucking Wakanda. He seems right. like he's all right. He wants to expand, and I mean, he's a little material. Like he's he has like this military streak to him. But if he just cooled that down, he yeah. would be all right. But, like, you know, he should be a fucking evil mercenary who kills people, and you should not really like the character. But uh, in fiction today, you're right. Everyone wants to just have their villains be cool and likable, and it's just, like, I want Dr. Doom to be Dr. Doom. Doom. Yeah. And I always worry if they do Dr. Doom, they're going to make him, like, cool. Like, you you want him, you, you might not want him to win, but you wouldn't mind if he won, yeah. you know? Like, I, I, no, I don't want that. I'll throw some heavy stakes in there and make it so you want that fucking guy to be a bastard. Who's a character in a movie that or a book that you've read that was just a straight bastard? You want them to get their comeuppance? Oh well, I mean, uh, I mean, what well, I'm gonna say like that's one of like the kind of like the tropes of Stephen King is like his bad guys. You hate them. <laughs> like his bad guys are really good bad guys. Yeah. Like the the whole Men in Black and Randall Flags and all his different iterations. He's just a fucking dick piece. Just <laughs> you just want him to go down hard. Uh, I'm trying to think from movies because, like, Willem Dafoe did a good job in that last Spider-Man of just being crazy. But he was oh, crazy, yeah. though. So you were just like, okay, he's kind of crazy, but he's still so evil. Yeah. But every other villain in that movie, you're like, nah, they're still, they're like, you know, you kind of root for him a little bit. Yeah. You want him to, you want him to uh, change their ways and be good. And, and just to talk about the other side of the coin for a sec, like, you know, we got, like, the Joker, which yeah. was really good. And but and but they don't necessarily like make him like a good person. They show why he's the way that he is. They humanized him. Yes, but uh, oh man, I am interested how like that second one's gonna turn out with fucking. Uh, are they gonna actually go like more superhero with it, or are they just gonna? Well, apparently, uh, they're talking about introducing Harley Quinn, and there's talks that it's gonna be um. Lady Gaga yeah. as her, and it's gonna the movie's gonna be like a musical. Oh, oh, <laughs> oh! Sorry, that like I got revolted. <laughs> I, can't you didn't I hear just it. thought about it, and I was like, oh no, because like they did the dance scene, 
and on the stairs, and I just feel like that's the only thing they took away from that movie. It was like, <laughs> oh, that was like a really iconic scene. Let's make the whole movie that scene. I was like, oh, God, they imagine Joker just dancing in the rain, <laughs> and him and Harley Quinn are stabbing people. Like, fuck, I don't want it. And, and you know what? Lady Gaga's acting. Nothing against Lady Gaga, really. I just, like, I because I watched her in that American Horror Story, and I was just like, this is fucking stupid. And then, like, she did that Bradley Cooper movie, and... I just, I don't Gucci. Know. She's Gucci. She's Gucci. I just, I see her, like, giving award speeches and shit. I'm just like, come on. Can you suck your own farts any harder, lady? Like, <laughs> I just, nah. I don't want that. Does anybody want that? I wasn't particularly fond of that idea when I heard it. We'll see what happens. Um, Let's get on to the episode, because... Which is... Listening to the Drunk Pen Writing Podcast. Don't give me that look. Fucking jerk. Give me that jerk look. Or is that just your face? I can't. Uh, got a monitor kind of half covering. Uh, 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 uh. What am I, like, Wilson? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's all I ever see. Nobody ever gets this view. He has a TV monitor right in front of him. So I only see from your nose up. So the, the bottom half of your face is just, you know. See, but I just can't ever spout wisdom like he did. Yeah. Yeah, you don't give much good wisdom. No. But to be fair, I said gooder in the cold open. So. <laughs> and I might have I might have meant that. You don't know. Nobody knows. Um, what I say, so this is DPW, we're a podcast. We got writing and stuff we're doing things. About. What do I do now? I'm the host. I am the host, your host with the most, Caleb James, with me today. As always, as always, Spencer, the Kilkenny clown killer church. You're a clown killer from Kilkenny. Uh a mouthful. Kilkenny's yeah. in Ireland, by the way, if you weren't aware. You know what we're going to talk about? Because I want you to feel bad. Yay! I want you to feel as bad as you made me feel. I don't know. You guys, when I was trying to take a nap earlier, yeah. then I thought, oh, Spencer's coming over. I got to wake up. Because it was only 10 minutes. And then my alarm went off. And then I fucking sat on the couch waiting. And you texted me, oh, I'm going to be late today. And I'm like, you motherfucker. I could have been. And it turns out you were napping. Yeah. I could have been napping longer. You could have been. I needed it more. You you probably yeah, probably. Uh, uh so today's episode is sponsored by Squarespace. Squarespace. No, we lost that sponsorship. Circle space? Mmm Triangle. Octagon. Let's say what about uh Pentagon. Uh today I wanted to talk about effort, Spencer. Uh what That's why you're gonna hate it. It's about effort. I have some news. That's what brought this about, and I don't know if it's good news. So, I saw an ad for, I think it's Sequestrum Magazine. It's a weird one. Sequestrum Magazine. They were doing like a writing contest, and the theme was place. And I thought, you know what? I haven't submitted anything to anywhere this year. I should write a short story for this. So, here's what I did, Spencer. I sat down immediately, and I just wrote a story in one shot, and then the next day, which was yesterday, I finished editing the story while I went and edited it, and then I submitted it. Yeah. So clap, clap, clap for that, because I did not, which is what what I would have done in the past, I did not take a break from my novel to do that. I still was working on my novel during the day and did that in the evening, Mm. and then that made me think, well, maybe I should do another uh submission somewhere and i found another cool contest that popped up and this one is you you have to use like the opening and ending lines of a famous uh i don't know if it was like either a famous novel or whatever novelist they select I have to look into it more but it's like that could be fun so i'm thinking maybe i should just start submitting a lot of stuff places as long as it doesn't interfere with my projects i mean yeah i mean that's not a that's a very solid idea yeah i thought it would be a uh, kind of fun uh, cause also it kind of helps get you out of, you know, being stuck on that one thing too much. Like you can still work on that thing, but then take a creative break by thinking about something completely different. And the style that I wrote the short story was 100% different than what I'm writing now. So I imagine that, uh, you probably just went on your laptop probably. No, I still wrote it by hand. I actually oh. have to show I don't think I showed you. I got these fancy, fancy, uh, minimalistic, uh, Japanese notebooks. Uh. Um, I, I actually just ordered one cause they're like 10 bucks. They don't even have a cover, 
Uh, it's hard to explain. It's just like plain, but they're really cool and they're really good, really, really good paper, actually. But I ordered one and I got it off of Amazon and it just like it was delayed, delayed. And then they just said, oh, it was lost in shipping. So I was like, ah, fuck it. I'll get a refund eventually. So I ordered another one. And then would you know it? The other one came too, so I ended up getting two. Oh, well, there you go. Yeah, so I, th- I'm using that to do like experimental fiction and short stories and stuff. But that got me thinking, Spencer, because I know you like when I think. Uh-huh. How much effort do we actually put into what we're doing? Because in the like I said in the past, I would have probably held off on my novel for however long it took me to write that short story and just focused on that. And then I'm thinking. I'm probably just doing that to procrastinate from working on my novel. Yeah. And then I was thinking deeper into it. Like I was looking deeper into it. How often do we do that? How often do we do what we think is being productive, but actually isn't productive? So say I'm supposed to write today, but I didn't because I wrote, I read five chapters of the book I'm reading Mm -hmm. And it's a good book, but I feel productive because I read five chapters of the book. You know, I made some progress. Maybe yeah. it was a difficult book, but that's not writing. Nope. That's not pro- productivity. That's not producing anything because you're just consuming something. It's no different than really watching TV. No. Granted, it could be beneficial. You might take more from the book. It might help your writing reading that book. But what you should really do is write. Now, we talked about this before, like write first. You know, make sure that's your top priority is writing. And then you can go and read and do all the other stuff. I forget what it was. It was like, uh, I forget whose rule that was actually, but maybe it was that art, uh, war of art or whatever we read. I, I forget, but it's like, you have to section off your day. So what we do is we know we have 20% fuck off time and 50% work and you know, it's all broken up. But what most people do is they end up always flipping it. So they leave their writing that's what we'll use, but you know, it could be art, it could be movie making, whatever. But they leave that for the very end of the day after they've after done all the other stuff. And you'll burn out. Yeah, and but and what exhausted. you should do is do that first, like you would with your job. Uh, and we talked about making right in your job, and you have to treat it as such. But that's easier said than done. Oh yeah. Uh, but what I think is really beneficial is maybe you can still break it up where you get to do your fuck off stuff. That even you know us watching master class, for instance. Yeah. That's kind of being productive, but that's not, you know, not we're not really, making, again, no. we're not producing anything. We're not making anything. We're not writing. That's the important thing is you should be writing. So we could just as easily do a writing session first uh-huh. uh, then watch, watch a master class or like we do the podcast. The podcast was never supposed to be a substitute for our writing. Yeah. It was supposed to just be a companion to our writing. And right. we've kind of elevated it to be like the important thing that yes. we do every week. And then we put the writing on the back burner and do that, you know, whenever, which we shouldn't No, we should do the writing in the podcast as the companion to the writing. Like it was well, originally and before, supposed to. And before the, the podcast, it was writing things for the website. Yeah. We and start now- again. We started the website because we wanted to boost our writing and it was going to be a companion to our writing. But what we ended up doing was <laughs> focusing on oh well we should get some stories out for the website which is good because yeah. we were writing but then it morphed into well we should probably do some articles and then we started writing things well, that like, we wouldn't want to write like what would make the website better th- other yeah. than having this website to where we could just put things on yeah so and then it just became about content creation it just became about putting content out. So here's Spencer putting out comic reviews that he probably wouldn't have reviewed otherwise. No, you wouldn't have done it for fun, right? You wouldn't have cared to review most of the like you might have wanted to tell somebody about them. Espe- yeah, especially those single issue reviews yeah. I was doing there at the beginning. Like, yeah, like maybe those trades and stuff like that. Like, yeah, like those I don't, you know, because you got a whole thing, you can kind of, but you, know, you can kind of pitch that. But yeah, single issue reviews. But there were years there where our numbers were booming on the site. The site was doing great, but we weren't doing the work we actually set out to do because yeah. we were focused on building the site making content for the yeah. site, writing for the site, and then all our stories became focused. Well, we're going to publish these on here yeah. versus doing our own stuff. Now, this last year, we got away from that. We yeah. decided, especially with the pandemic, when that hit and shit, we were like, you know what? We need to start working on our own projects. And, you know, we're going to write for the site. How about we do what our initial goal was, was to just do a DPW short story public, you know, like a anthology and things like that. Uh, and then the site's just to help promote that. Yes. And we need to, and, and what really went down the rabbit hole 
of uh you know just having content for content sake we started taking work from outside sources uh we do contests and stuff and i always like the halloween contest but we started doing things like that to get work from other people so we didn't have to put as much work on ourselves you know we could have but it actually then, ended up doing more work because yeah, especially for you because it takes you, way longer because you have to review and edit everything yeah and putting re- it on the website review you know read all the uh read all the submissions and do all that shit and all these people like it became so popular everyone's submitting and all this work comes in and then throughout the year everybody wants to uh, work and for a long time you were getting just inundated with fucking shitload of comic yeah. reviews from indie comics and it got to the point where neither of us were actually doing our own writing. We were focusing on everybody else's it, writing. It could, could you imagine, like, if we actually had, like, even if it was just the uh, collection of short, short stories, if we had that out whenever, like, the height of, like, when we were getting, like, not big numbers, but, like, big numbers for, like, the, the most numbers, were, like, we were getting, you know, at the time. Yeah. And we actually had something to be like, oh, hey, if you like this stuff on this website... We also have this you can buy, like you know what I mean, and we could that was a mit that was a missed opportunity. Well, say um for every ten people who were on our site like enjoying the work that we were putting out, if just like one out of those ten people bought our anthology if we had it out and you added up all the numbers, that still would have been a couple thousand dollars, yeah. probably just because like the numbers we were putting in like every month and i'm I'm just like. Ah, fuck it yeah you're right that's like that was like a missed opportunity but again also it was a learning process we weren't yeah. either of us weren't like great writers oh no we like, neither we one of us probably shouldn't have been putting out in, like a sell, collection yeah. like that at, at the time anyways but so i'm not mad about you know any of that though if i was to change anything it would have like i would go back and just focus more on doing fiction for the site and kind of curtail the article though i did learn a lot from doing those articles and stuff and even like the podcast and stuff. I don't know if we went back, would we want to make this more of a fiction oriented podcast? Uh, like reading our work on air and things like that, or just something completely different. I don't know. See, well, the thing though that I think works with us for the podcast, and I don't know, this is just me and the way like I consume podcasts is like, I don't know, like if I was listening to the Dead Robot Society, another writing podcast that we've both listened to. If it was just like them reading some of like their short stories, you probably get bored. And- I'd probably get bored. I ha- most of the time, I really like it when they're not even really talking about writing. When they're just rambling on about stupid shit, yeah. like I through listening through the- all their episodes, you've caught con- like uh, you know you like them. You're like yeah, that- that's the reason why you you would get any of that work is just because like oh I feel like I know these guys do this podcast. And I kind of want to support them. I want to actually check out what, you know, something that they actually did. Well, I kind of feel like those guys have shifted towards the just doing the podcast for content sake. Yeah. Like what we were falling into there, where it seems like maybe they don't necessarily enjoy doing the podcast as much. Well, or, well, they, they seem like they've scaled back. Well, so I, what I'm well, thinking is they're I like, think, no, we got to focus on our actual writing. Yeah, I, I think they have came to the conclusion that we are coming to where they're like, no, our stories are what's important. The podcast. It might bring out. in readers and it might be, you know, fun to interact with people, but it's a companion thing. Yeah, it will come out when it comes out, whenever they have time to actually record. Yeah, I mean, just the way our schedules work, we're still able to do it weekly, but I don't think like the pressure of having to do you know release one every week we're failures that kind of mentality is really not necessary as long as we're actually doing the work we want to do mm-hmm. and like the podcast is good because it keeps us on track with what we're doing and stuff but then there's also stretches where it's like oh did you write this week no did you write this did week no and it's like what the fuck are we doing then <laughs> like why are we even on here talking telling people to write if we're not writing right, yep. i mean i could say like i feel like with this year i've got my shit together though writing wise because I write every day now. And honestly, I think the biggest shift for me was just switching to writing by hand. It's completely shifted how I focus on writing. And it just, I don't know if it makes it more accessible because I just pull up the notebook everywhere. But it takes away that extra bullshit of like, oh, got to get the laptop. Oh, is it charged? Oh, got to open oh. up the screen. And then I'm staring at the blank thing. When I had the, the note. Is the Wi-Fi connected? Yeah. When I had the, fi- the Grammarly's yelling at me. Like <laughs> when I had the physical notebook. I'm literally just focused on the words I'm putting down. Like, I could just start. There's no thought process. I just go into it. And, then, like, that story, that story, because uh, you asked me if I wrote that just on the computer or not. 
I didn't. I wrote it by hand first and then transcribed it to the computer. And that completely changed that process too. Like the editing process, it just like changed how I thought about it. But that's why I was able to write that whole story within like an hour uh, and then edit it within like an hour. And it was just really fun to do that because it was a more creative piece. And I was able to just flow through it without worrying about anything. I I don't have to worry about like the grammar and the you know, sentence structure and going back and changing things because if it's fucked up, it's fucked up. Like yeah. I can't, it's ink. Like I'm not yeah. erasing it and going back. So I just fucking, I'll, if something's too fucked up, I'll scratch it out and go on, but yeah. I don't have to worry about any of that. And it's just completely changed my focus of how I write and just, I, I feel more engaged to what I'm writing. I enjoy what I'm writing more. And just like every day I go into it, it's not like that. Oh, I want to write, but like quotations, you know, it's like, yeah, if I can, Oh, yeah, I want to write, but I probably would rather be watching TV. Yeah. No, like, I actually want to write. And when I have the notebook in my hand, I'm like, I want to open this up and I want to write. Like, I don't feel like fucking off too much. Uh, and I just get mad. at Like, before, I'd get mad at myself for, oh, I didn't fucking get any writing done today. I didn't go downstairs and get the laptop. Like, now I don't really worry about that. It's just like, because, I, as you know, going into the year, my goal was, oh, I'm going to do five out of seven days. Then it was seven out of seven. And then, you know, got to, like, you get that obsessive point. But then I was able to kind of tear back. So if there's a day where I just don't feel like writing, I just yeah. won't. And I don't feel bad about it at all. And that takes the pressure off. But it does, like I've noticed, I've done that uh, a handful of times now over the last couple of months just because of work and it's been hard and stuff. Some days I'm like, I don't really feel creative today. I'm not going to write. And it's a conscious decision. And I don't beat myself up about it. And the next day I just go into writing like nothing happened. Yeah, because, like, you know, we say that, you know, uh, one of the, the, the common things that are, of advice is like, you know, you got to get down in front of the laptop or the notebook or whatever. And even if it's like a couple hundred words, you do that, you did that for the day. But like if you're just completely out of it and chances are whenever you go back to look at it the next day, you're just going to be like highlight, delete, 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 delete. <laughs> like, you know, or, or scratch off or whatever, you you know, whatever you're doing. I think it's important to write every single day if it's, you know, available to you. Uh, for us, it is really, honestly, uh, write every single day just to get the habit formed. And then once you no longer have to think about writing every day, it's just something you'd go into. Then you can like, you know, scale it back need be, or just take days off, things like that. As long as it's not going to revert back to your old bad habits of just skipping writing for four five, six days at a time, you know, now the next portion of this, uh, which is, it uh, goes with like the bad productivity of, Oh yeah, I'm going to read a book today, but then you're not actually creating what our problem is for the long or was for the longest time, I think, was this whole idea of just showing up. As long as I show up, I'm doing good, you know? So like the podcast, as long as we're here, that's fine. Doesn't matter if the podcast sucks, as yeah. long as we show up to do it, uh, that's the same with writing. Well, maybe the writing's not great or the story sucks or I don't even have any intention on finishing short. As long as I'm writing it, I'm good. That is like as you always use the gym uh, analogies, that's like going to the gym the important thing at first is just to show up to build that habit of just being there in the moment and just doing it and you don't even have to work out just as long as you went to that gym that's building the habit of going and then but eventually you have to work out yeah so like that's good to start off but once you get to a certain point you have to kind of get past that yeah so yeah you could be writing every day just to put words down and that's good you're showing up you're doing something but at some point, you actually have to put down the meaningful words. You actually have to tell the stories you want to tell. You actually have to write the book you want to write. You can't do that forever. You can't just go, oh, I'm going to go in there and I'm just going to write some bullshit things and some blocks of dialogue. And I, that's another story I'm just going to not finish. Uh, because how many fucking unfinished stories do you have? I know I got hundreds. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And now sometimes stories do fail. Sometimes you go through with the good intentions oh, and yeah, they just are not yeah, good. It just fuzz out the, the idea doesn't quite work or whatever. But the problem is when you sh- you think you're doing something by writing that story and then it fails and then the next story fails and then you just keep doing that and you never finish anything because all you're doing is showing up, which is the exciting part for a lot of people. It's like, oh, I, 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 I got to it. I started the story. That's exciting, but then once you get into the monotony of, okay, now I'm in the middle. (laughs) I'm in the fucking part that kind of drags, and I need to pick it up, and I have to start focusing on pacing and shit. When you get to the hard stuff, that's when you need to go, okay, I have to actually work and finish this. Uh, And most, well, not most people, I'm not going to talk for, you know, speak for everybody, but for me, it was always like, well, I'm not having fun with this anymore. I'm going to do something else. 
I'm going to go chase that other idea that's a little more entertaining. And then I have so much work that just didn't get accomplished because of that. And I fucking feel like I wasted too much time and I don't want to do that anymore. So I think it's important to just, uh, yeah, initially you just show up and get the habit down of writing every day if you can or just whenever you can. But at some point you actually just have to do the writing and stick with it. And like we've talked about like taking breaks, the importance of that and stuff. But I think that should be between works, mm-hmm. uh, between projects. Because if you take too much of a break away from a project, you might not get back to it. I mean, you yeah. might not want to get back to it. Yeah, especially if it's not like in between drafts. If it's yeah. like if it's you might lose the, the passion for yeah. it. Yeah, between in between drafts, is, like if you do the first draft, you can let it breathe. You could take maybe even a couple months off. Uh, before you edit it, but that's because it's done. Yeah. But if you're halfway done, and then you're like, ah, I'm gonna take a couple months away from this and do some other stuff, and then I'm gonna come back to it. Uh, chances are you're not gonna want to come back to it, or you're just gonna be like, this. You'll you probably get down on yourself, like, ah, this is shit because it's a first draft that's unfinished. Mm-hmm. You're like, this is garbage. I don't want to do it. It's important to like just try to finish it, even if it sucks. Which is what I'm doing with my work now. Is I'm I'm going through you know like my novel, but even the short stories and stuff. It's like. Even if I just have to go, you know, I get to the climax and I don't know where, what's going to happen after the climax and I just, I'm really struggling to finish this. I don't even want to write it anymore. I could just go, and then she died the end. Yeah. Like, just fucking hard finish, just so it's done. And then you can go back and be like, all right, well, now I can maybe actually do an ending after I edit some of this and work on it. Like, you don't, because not everybody writes the same, but you, you do have to finish stuff or else what's the point? Now, we've talked about this in the past, or at least touched on it before. Uh, might have even did a whole episode on it. I don't really remember at this point. But we touch a lot of things. Yeah, we touch on a lot of things, and then we just run away like fucking crooks in the night. Uh, I kept it at crooks because that's better than you know what we probably are in the night. <laughs> oh, gross. But going along with effort, one thing where I feel a lot of writers fail, because uh, we talk about like just showing up, what's beyond showing up? Not just doing the work, but doing the suck-ass work. Like, because we talked about, uh, you know, well, you got to learn to write, and that's not the fun part. Uh, like the grammar stuff, or just how to tell a story, the pacing stuff, like all the things we talk about on this show. But when it comes down to it, I feel like so many people want to just skip all that. Like they feel like, oh, if I just write a story, people are gonna want to buy it. No, no. Even if it's an interesting idea, they're not gonna want to buy it if you don't know how to write it. And you don't, especially re- if you're like, if you're new, like you, you yeah, an unknown. Like, tell a creative story, but if you just do it in the mundane, born, like, say you're an adequate writer as far as just grammar and stuff goes. Like, you can write an essay for school. Like, that's your level. Like, you can write an essay for school, and it'd be a passing grade, and that's about it. You don't have any uh, twenty dollar words in your vocabulary. You're not doing any interesting. Um, literary gymnastics by any means like there's no uh fucking cool sentences or anything like that like, everything's just very straightforward think of Hemingway without metaphor yeah. like just very point by point kind of stories that we make fun of all the time on here if you have a cool idea but you tell the story in that way nobody's gonna give a shit for the most part granted some people like Stephanie Meyer have been able to get away with that just because of the genre uh if there's a genre there's always people there but as much as we shit on Stephanie Meyer I haven't actually read her work other than excerpts, to really judge how it is as a whole. Yeah. Uh, as far as I can tell, it's not a very creative style of writing. Uh, but the subject matter... I don't even know why the subject matter was so popular, honestly. I think she just kind of caught a wave. Mm. Because for every Stephanie Meyer of Twilight, there's how many people that toil away in Aww. obscurity. Just, like, like, just go on Amazon and just type in, like, vampire books and just see... What, you know, the, 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 the slew of the pages upon pages of... Yeah. Uh, just endless, the same story probably, just endlessly told, uh, in vastly uncreative ways. And we've talked about, like, finding your own voice and stuff. That's usually what, one of the most important things in, uh, having a creative narrative. Like, that's where that comes from. Being able to tell a story in your own way, that's unique. But if you... Like, if you just decide to skip that stuff and you don't do the practice and you don't do the shit work of uh, writing, and you can see that last episode where we did the the uh, scene in different mm. styles and stuff. Like, if you skip all that stuff and you just try to write a story, it's probably going to be boring. Like, I, don't, I cannot imagine anyone being able to just write a story without having really worked on the craft and more specifically on their personal style it's it, like it's it's i just don't think it's gonna work like can you imagine reading 
uh, well, we've read indie authors work that is kind of like that, where it's just like, you get into it and every page reads the same and you really think people are going to buy your next book. Mm. You're probably lucky they bought that one. Honestly, like I'm not saying be experimental and you know, you have to be super metaphor heavy or any of this like literary stuff. You just have to be unique and you have to be able to tell stories in a way that people are going to want to read more of your work. Yeah. And the only way to do that is actually put in the work of writing a bunch of shit stories, honestly, mm-hmm. uh, which we both have plenty of experience of. Oh, yeah. That's one thing that, you know, we we're talking about the DPW site and everything earlier. Uh, that was beneficial in the fact that it built up our styles. Because, like, one thing with the articles, we learned how to tell informative, like, an informative style of writing and kind of storytelling depending because you still are kind of telling the story it's like a narrative but it's an article you know it's just information but to be unique and tell it in a way that's going to make the reader want to you know check out more articles you can't just again can't you can just be a scientific an, journal like, yeah, in an entertaining way that it can't just that, be info yeah you can't just have information unless you're david foster walls you have to actually <laughs> tell a story in an interesting way even if it's a like article so we found different ways of just expressing ourselves until we found the ones that kind of uh, more like a gelling process. You just get like this, these inchoate styles of writing and you worked on them and worked on them until they kind of hardened into your own style. Um, and that's not always easy to do. If it was easy, there'd be a lot better writers out, like a lot more quality yeah. writers out there. But without rambling too much, like people just want to skip all that. I don't know if you've noticed that, like people do not want to put in the work to suck like they don't want to suck but they don't want to do the work to get better and the only way to get better is by sucking for a while yep it's very fucking rare you're gonna get like a lebron james who just great out the get-go you know just as athletic freak who's gonna succeed in whatever sport he tries no matter what like for the most part it's gonna be you know a bunch of maybe mediocre white guys like us who if we ever wanted to do any kind of sport would have to work really really hard and be at the top of our game just to be adequate yeah just to just get an even shot like an opportunity and if you do like so in the arts it's the same thing like you might not be like a person might not be a great painter but you could probably work like if you have no talent at painting you could probably work to be at least adequate right yeah i've seen the you know the wine and painting wine or what what are those like the wine Wine, oh i forget the name of those but like you fucking paint and you drink wine Like, I've seen a lot of people do those, and just because of the style, like, how they are instructed, a lot of them come out pretty good. Yeah. And then a lot of people are like, holy shit, I didn't know I could do that. It's because you probably never tried. Yeah, right. And just with some instruction, uh, which by the person who's, you know, hosting the class probably mastered their craft, so they did it in a way that they could tell, other, you know, show other people how to do it. Well, that's like a... The 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 meme, I'm I'm pretty sure we shared on the, you know, the websites, like, social things, like, this was forever ago, but it was like a meme of like these stick figures of like, uh, you know, some person asking another person like, oh, oh, you're really good at drawing. I wish I could draw. And he's like, well, I, you know, you know, I practice for da 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 hours. And yeah. he's like, oh, well, I wish I could just do it. It's just like, well, you have to pray. Like, you know what yeah. I mean? You have to put that work in. Very rarely are you going to have that, like the savant that just is out of the gate you know yeah. can do whatever it is for every michelangelo there's guys like us who we would have to work our fucking balls off to just buy uh make stuff that people would be like yeah oh, i might buy that yeah. <laughs> like there's take, so- take it something like if you were at a convention <laughs> yeah you how many hours would it take to just to get you'd have to work for, at your craft to just get somebody to just stop for a second look at it side-eyed and go eh, and then just keep on going yeah <laughs> like there's so many and art's a good example especially conventions because you see a lot of stuff that it all looks the same. You go table to table, you sometimes catch those like, oh, you all kind of gave up at some point and just stuck with, like, you didn't really keep improving. Well, this is a little bit off topic, but I think a lot of that has to do with the the boom of the digital art. I think fucking digital art takes a lot of people's style away. It's like auto-tune and music. Yeah, yeah I mean, now granted, there are plenty of people who do like that draw digitally that you can definitely tell them apart. You know, like a Todd McFarlane. Yeah, like, you know what I mean? But uh, especially when you just come to, like, a lot of those amateurs, like, a lot of the stuff just looks the same. Because they're probably doing the same filters, it the same shape yeah, things. It doesn't look good, like, you know. Or even if it does kind of look all right, it looks like everything else. Yeah. So it doesn't stand out. I always believe, and I'm, I'm a firm believer in this, and 
I think it was a movie. It was like a shitty Mark Wahlberg movie. I never watched it. The only thing is he was like a teacher in an English class. And uh, what's her name that plays Captain Marvel? Brie Larson. Uh, she's like a, a literary genius, apparently. Like oh, she's wow. a writer. Uh, but he's in the class. It's a movie about gambling. I don't think it has anything to do with mm. this fucking shit. But there's a scene where he's talking about being a genius. And he, he like one of the guys in there is ranked number two at tennis or something in the world. And he talks about it. And essentially, the whole point is, uh, unless you are born a super talented genius, don't bother. That's like literally what he says in the, the scenes. Like, why even bother? Uh, because even he, like, he's a writer himself, but he, since he's not fucking, you know, Mark Twain or Fitzgerald or whatever, whoever you want to compare it to, he, uh, why even bother? That's his whole message. Why even try? Why be a middling novelist? Why give reviews to other shitty writers who only... You know, they just give you reviews, like whatever. Like the point is, he's talking about where unless you're a genius, don't even bother. And I completely disagree with that because I look at people like Stephen King, who are highly successful, write very entertaining stories, have created what I consider art. Who, pro uh, sure, there's a, always a level, different variances of talent. If you, some people just you're not going to do it. Yeah, I mean, that is the truth. Like some people want, might want to be a writer, but you just, you're not going to be a you writer. You just don't have it. You just don't have it, and that's fine. Fine. Something else that you could or do. Or even, even if it's one of those things like uh, you just enjoy doing it on your time off. Yeah. Like, you know what I mean? And you don't have. It doesn't have to be something that's going to make you millions of dollars, yeah. you know? Like, a Stephen King is one of those guys where he took whatever talent he had and he just fucking grinded and worked really hard uh, to elevate his craft and get where he wanted to be. And I would say Stephen King probably in the 80s topped out of his. Essentially, think of like a natural bodybuilder. Like, you are going to top out at your, what would be your perfect physique at some point, and you're just not going to be able to grow anymore. Unless not if gonna you take some kind of supplement. Well, that's what I'm saying. Like, you're going to, at your natural level, you're going to top out, and you're not going to be able to get any bigger or more shredded or whatever you want. You have to hop on steroids. So, there's no steroids for writing. So, Stephen King, oh I think. God, I, I think oh, so, <laughs> so much. It, oh. Yeah. <laughs> I think Stephen King, that would be awesome. <laughs> I think Stephen King reached his potential and probably exceeded it to some degree. Maybe he's an outlier and was able to step up above and do a little better. Well, uh, well could, what I think what helps with him too is like, because he was an English teacher, so he knew all the, the rules uh, and everything, everything yeah. like that. So he didn't have any issues with that. He also, he had stacks of rejection letters yeah. too, as well. So he knows what, what that's like to go through. And as we've seen in multiple like interviews and stuff like that, the one of the most famous one is when he's up there on the stage with George R. R. Martin, and he asked like, "How do you write so goddamn much?" Yeah. And Stephen King's answer is, "Well, well it's I, hard fucking work. Well, oh, eight I, hours a day. I like, treat it as a job. I I at least get six pages a day, dude. If I ever get six pages, if I get you be happy. If I get six pages in a week, I'd probably." Black back from from my from my <laughs> house to here. <laughs> like, <laughs> well, coming back to what I was saying, um, I am a firm believer in hard work. Ninety nine percent of the time is going to beat out natural talent that doesn't really try. So you could be one of those outlier geniuses, Michelangelo's, Fitzgerald's, fucking Dostoevsky, whatever. Like you could be one of those guys who, like, one of those people who just naturally are going to be great. But a lot of those people, they don't ever actually reach their full potential because they don't really have to. Uh, and another downfall of a lot of writers is when they get some success, uh, they stop trying and they don't continue to build on their craft and they don't work on it anymore. I'm thinking like maybe like a James Patterson type. Yeah. You're just kind of phoning it in. Maybe your stories are entertaining still. Maybe they're still selling. But you're not really creating probably the kind of art you imagined when you were a kid, you know? Like, oh, I want to do this and this and this. Well, you hit all the levels of success, so you don't really have to try as hard. Uh, and you can think of, like, a lot of, like, MMA fighters, like Conor McGregor. He got, you know, poor kid, eventually became champion, and then kind of fell off. I mean, granted, you talk about the competition and stuff, but a lot of people are like, well, he started partying. Mike Tyson's probably a better example. Yeah. Prime Mike Tyson. Uh, granted, there was like mental health issues in there and stuff, but he was like partying so much, and he just thought like when he went up against Buster Douglas, I could fuck this guy up, hungover, and not even have to try. And then you know that's when the hard work beats the natural mm -hmm. talent. 
Yep. Um, granted, not saying Mike Tyson didn't work hard because he was one of those guys that also grinded every yeah. day and was super fucking natural freak. Uh, those are the scariest people. Whoa. People who actually work super hard, like the Michael Jordan types, who are already natural, ta- talented freaks, and then work super hard on top of it. But you always get guys who... The, the uh, Peyton Mannings. Yeah. But then you always get people who just kind of give up and will just phone it in as long as they're hitting a certain level of success. So as a writer, I don't think you want to do that. I think it's always a learning thing. Like, you... Just, Till you die, just keep learning, keep working, keep improving. And I can't remember like who said this, and I'm sure it's probably been said through a couple of different things. But like each, like each new novel or short story should be like a challenge, or like a well, I'm gonna take a crack at doing this. Like this, maybe like there a, should be a chance of failure or, there. Yeah, or just like you know, what? I don't really do sci-fi stories. I'm going to do a sci-fi story just to see how it turns out and to see what I can do. And then the next story, maybe I'll do a Western or like, you know. Well, I've already decided that with my work, like once my first novel's done, the second novel is going to be vastly different style. Not just the subject matter, the actual style, I think, is going to be different. And like you could look at writers like Haruki Murakami, who, while not necessarily being very experimental with his style, he will try new things and he'll write, you know, this story's going to be first person. This one's third person. This one's going to have switching perspectives. Uh, I think he had a short story collection where like the, it's like a camera that's flying around kind of viewing things almost like he does. He does different things like well, that. And just well, from whatever from him, his like maybe not so much like his style, like he changes his style but like his subject matter. Yeah, like he he tells such kind of weird, strange things to where it's like, okay, the style can kind of be the same, but like the subject matter, like you were saying, is what really drives the piece. Well, James Joyce is an interesting example because he's one of those people who he decided to go full experimental, like full modernist. He went from, you know, just writing like kind of a. a he still was always kind of experimental, but he still would tell like normal stories here and there. And uh, like his first novel, it was more of a, a straightforward narrative. But then he just like, especially with his last two novels, just went more experimental. And you know, Finnegan's Wake, like oh, everybody considers it unreadable, but there's still a story there somehow. Yeah, this they got to be something there. Like he wasn't afraid to just like oh, because he wrote that. It took him 17 years to write that, and everyone told him oh, this is dog shit. Stop writing it. And he just kept writing. It. He's like, fuck it. I don't care if I fail. I'm going to do it. But anyway, so we don't drag on forever. uh, Do the work, man. Yes. Uh, And don't fake productivity. Don't do things that are, oh, this is productive when it's like not. No. I mean, you can still do the things you enjoy. You can still watch TV. You can still read. You can do whatever. But make the writing your priority or the art or whatever it is that you want to accomplish in life. Any parting words, Spencer? Just echoing what, uh, what we've basically been saying the whole time, you know. Just uh, put in the effort, put the nose to the grindstone, cliche, cliche, cliche. Elbow sweat, elbow, elbow grease. grease. Yes. It's gross. Yeah. Why is your elbow, is it the outer elbow that's always greasy or is it the inner elbow? Well, it's my inner elbow that's it. That's if, what if, gets if, greasy, yeah. but like the elbow's the outside. Yeah. So what, I what never, is the inside of the elbow called? I don't know. Actually, Mindy had a rash or something, like a heat rash there the other day. It was like a little thing from just, you know, because it's being creased yeah. she, the way, she, you know, her job. And I was just like, ew, your, your <laughs> upper form connecting to bicep is rat. Like, I don't know what to call it. Like, I don't, I'm sure it has a name. The inner crease of your, the your arm's armpit is. <laughs> your, your forearm pit. Yeah. It's like, what's the back of your knee called? Same thing. The bendy parts. Your bendy. <laughs> Your bendy flesh is gross. But then that could mean other things. <laughs> Thank you for listening. Uh, uh, you can check out our word at drunkenpenwriting.com, Facebook and Instagram at drunkenpenwriting, and Twitter at drunkenwriting. Spencer's yawning, which means it's time to go. So uh, we will check you later. <laughs>